your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently, and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. A very good morning to you. This is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and your radio. Today, we'll be talking defence, we'll be talking Brexit, and we'll be talking sexual misconduct. All that to come after your headlines. A very good morning to you. It's just gone half past nine. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date today on GB News. Now, Danish police say there is no indication that the deadly shooting in Copenhagen yesterday was an act of terror. At least three people were killed, four critically injured, when a gunman opened fire in one of the biggest shopping centres in the country. A 22-year-old Danish man is appearing in court today. The Prime Minister is facing calls to explain what he knew about allegations of inappropriate behaviour involving MP Chris Pincher before giving him a job. Now, Boris Johnson is alleged to have called him Pincher by name, Pincher by nature, before making him Deputy Chief Whip of the Conservative Party. The allegations of behaviour emerged just days after Pincher resigned as Deputy Chief Whip and was suspended from the Conservative Party for allegedly groping two men last week. Traffic was temporarily brought to a standstill on the crossing of the River Severn this morning in a protest over high fuel prices. A convoy of about 20 vehicles are driving slowly on the Prince of Wales Bridge. Several other go-slow demonstrations are planned for today. It says the price of petrol hit a record high of more than 191 pence per litre. The Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has vowed to regain lost territory as Russia claims full control of the eastern Lushank region of the country. Ukraine's forces withdrew from the bombed-out city of Lushank, the last major city in the region to fall to Russia, saying it was a tactical decision to save lives. It says the UK's Foreign Secretary Liz Truss will pledge today Britain's long-haul support for Ukraine. Just one singles player remains in Wimbledon as week two of the tennis tournament gets underway. All of Britain's hopes now rest on Cameron Norrie, who faces Belgium's number one, David Goffin, tomorrow. We're on your TV, online and DAB Plus radio. This is GB News. Now let's head back to the briefing with Tom. A very good morning to you. It's 9.30 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and on your radio. Now, Westminster begins the week uneasy, rocked by those allegations against former Deputy Chief Whip Chris Pincher. What did the Prime Minister know and when? And today, a big speech on Brexit from Sir Keir Starmer. Let's look ahead to what today and indeed this week has in store for us. Now, I'm delighted to be joined in the studio by James Heal, diary editor at The Spectator. Thanks for joining us this morning in the studio, James. Um, firstly, let's look at the context of these scandals involving particularly the Tory party, although, of course, other parties have had MPs uh, in hot water over sexual misconduct as well. What's the lay of the land today? Well, I think that the weekend saw a number of fresh allegations made against uh, Chris Pincher. I was reading, trying to count them up this morning. I think there's about a dozen now of allegations of misconduct against him. And so the question now goes on to what did Boris Johnson know and when? Um, and he's due back in the Commons today for his first time after that um, globe-trotting tour of Europe. Um, got about a dozen days out of the country, which I'm sure he enjoyed a break from. And so it, it now comes down to issues about 
um, what did what did Johnson know um, when you appointed Pinchard to be Deputy Chief Whip, and how you can square that with some of the um, commentary that's been going on? Because I think ministers are increasingly reluctant to go out and defend Number Ten and, and the Downing Street operation mm. when the line is going to change. Just hours later. Yes, it's, it was interesting listening to Simon Hart, the Wales Secretary, on Friday morning, who did a bit of freelancing, it almost seems, sort of suggesting that the whip would be suspended, and then it obviously became suspended later that day. I wonder, to what extent did the Prime Minister know about this? We remember back to February when there was that reshuffle, when Chris Pincher got appointed as Deputy Chief Whip. I was reading my tweets from the time earlier today, and uh, there was a lot of uh, remark about how long Chris Pincher remained in Downing Street. Some people thought he might be being appointed chief whip and then he only ended up as deputy chief. I wonder what those discussions for those long hours were uh, back in February. Well, uh, Chris Pincher was invaluable in the Prime Minister's survival around that time, January, February. He was part of the operation Save Big Dog. And he is a man with um, formidable political intelligence and had obviously previously served as a whip himself. Um, so clearly there were some discussions going on about what his role should be. And I think now there is a bit of consternation about what his role ended up being, which was Deputy Chief Whip, mm -hmm. with a role for welfare and MPs. And of course, he was facing these allegations and accusations at the same time. So there's some concern about letting him occupy such a prominent position in the party. Um, and again, the question to which Boris Johnson's um, judge of character now comes up, and that's what's being asked by a number of MPs, who, of course, on Wednesday, were going to vote on the 1922 committee, which could help decide Johnson's fate. It's interesting, though, looking at all of these different allegations, some of them dating back for quite some time, and looking at all of the different MPs that this seems to have sort of uh, rolled into one, this big sexual misconduct scandal. I wonder to what extent is this a Westminster problem? To what extent is this a societal problem more broadly? And to what extent can Boris Johnson himself really be blamed for what some of his 600 and, uh, 365 MPs might have got up to? I think obviously you need to add in the qualifier that MPs are, have an additional spotlight on them and which uh, is shone on few other people to the same extent in society. But that being said, there does seem to be um, a rather depressing number of these kind of scandals, uh, typically involving um, things to do with power structures and the knowledge that people can get away with it. Um, I mean, obviously, Chris Pincher will need to be, be the allegations against him need to be properly investigated. Mm -hmm. But of course, all this sort of surfaced five years ago, some of these mm -hmm. um, similar claims. So um, it, it does lead to the sense that some people can maybe get away with some things which others in society can't. And I think it's noticeable that um, what's really telling in some of these things is the relationship between staff and MPs. And there's a 20 year age difference with the power that brings in. Some people talk about the alcohol culture in Westminster. I think that's a, a slight factor. But I would also add that some of these allegations against Pincher were people uh, premises off away from Westminster, mm. Carlton Club or the Midland Hotel in Manchester as well. Mm. It's, it's interesting, though. Of course, um, Chris Pincher denies those allegations uh, and there will now be investigations. But um, I wonder to what extent the structure of MPs' offices mm. is played into this, because they're very small teams. It's, it's members of parliament with maybe uh, two staff, perhaps, three staff, perhaps, in Westminster itself. I, I just wonder that were MP offices more similar to the offices of uh, members of other legislatures around the world, so, uh, larger teams, perhaps uh, structures within those teams rather than just sort of an MP and a junior staffer sitting close together in some fusty office. If these were potentially larger teams, better structured, better funded, might we avoid some of these situations? I think there's a very good case for that right now, looking at some of the HR problems that have happened over the past decades. and There have been constant calls for reform, for a really independent agreements process. Because, of course, if you've got a complaint against your MP, any person you can take to is your MP, is your line manager. And you get some fantastic MPs with their staff, but you get others who, as we've seen can, time and time again, don't have that kind of mm. uh, respect for their members of staff. And equally, also, there's a good legislative case for it, which is that if you had MPs with, say, even maybe a, a fraction of what the resources that um, congressmen in America get, mm. you could see much better scrutiny of the bills which Parliament uh, is debating, which government's trying to ram through, and actually you've just got one overworked caseworker. Um, and one undersourced researcher. And it is extraordinary also that these people are paid through MPs' expenses, technically. So then you get all these websites showing MPs claiming £300,000 of expenses, but actually that's the staffing budget, not what they themselves use. Um, just finally on this point, I wonder to what extent th the way in which that structure uh, could be changed. Currently, we have 
the situation where lots of MPs have maybe two or three staffers, one of whom calls themselves a chief of staff in some sort of <laughs> peculiar way, and, and, and is, no, is, is, is no such thing in any meaningful sense of the word. What's the possibility for actual reform to the structure of MPs' offices? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm quite a cynic about this, I'm afraid. I, I very much doubt much will happen, and um, we're going to keep talking about these scandals for a very long time to come, sadly. Um, I, it, it, there's so many issues facing the country right now. Understandably, some of the um, people watching this might wonder why MPs are obsessing on navel-gazing, um, but I also think that there's powerful um, in incentives in retaining the existing structure, so I'm very pessimistic about any kind of change happening anytime soon. Gosh, well, let's leave that conversation to the side now, because, of course, there's something else going on mm. in Westminster today, which is that uh, Sir Keir Starmer is delivering a speech about Brexit. Now, earlier today, we spoke to uh, Jenny Chapman, the, uh, cabinet, the Shadow Cabinet Office Minister, uh, who, who told Eamon and Isabel a little bit about what Labour is going to say today. What we're saying is that since we've left the European Union, the government has gone about it in a very um, a way that's about sowing division, making things harder, not easier. We think the problems that do exist, and we're not pretending they're not there, are resolvable. So take the issue around Northern Ireland, for instance. We think that by taking a mature, considered response rather than being provocative and trying your best to destroy any trust that remains, that we can resolve those issues. Um, once you've done that, then you're into um, the Horizon project and scientific collaboration, which is really important um, for universities and scientists in this country. And if you want to grow your economy in the UK, which we do, you have to sort these issues out first. So we're saying ah. the government is making heavy weather of it. It doesn't have to be that way. There's another way of doing it. And actually, the Labour Party would be much, much better placed at getting these issues resolved. Um, I really specifically want to ask you about that because this really is an interesting point. So this is about the huge number of really, really top-of-their-game scientists in this country who are all qualified to be part of this project, the Horizon Project. They get loads of funding from the EU, but they can only qualify for it if they move out of the UK and live within the European Union. So how are you going to solve it? You make it sound so easy. Well, actually... That's not true, what you just said. You know, Horizon has been agreed. Um, it's already been agreed that the UK scientists can be part of Horizon. No, I'm not the saying they can't be part now, of it. They can't access oh, the funds. Well, well, the problem now is that the EU, and we think wrongly, is saying that until we get the Northern Ireland Protocol issues resolved, that they are going to hold back on our membership of Horizon. Now, we don't agree with that. Uh, we think that it's much more important for scientists, not just here, but around the world and in the EU, if we can get this issue moved on. But we do have to recognise that the way the government is going about mishandling the issues in Northern Ireland is causing a breach of trust and issues, you know, not just with our European partners, but actually it's causing us difficulties in securing closer trade arrangements with the United States as well. So getting the Northern Ireland Protocol issues sorted out is the first thing you have to do if you want to not just get access to Horizon, but resolve many other issues as well, and actually start behaving like a country that people want to do business with. But, um, Baroness, what, what I'm slightly confused about is that people or Europe can't do business with Keir Starmer, at least not for another couple of years or so. So what difference does it make as to what Keir Starmer thinks? <laughs> uh, I, think, I think the problem is, um, are, you try, are you saying put us in power and we can make Brexit work, the Brexit that Boris Johnson negotiated. We can make Boris Johnson's Brexit work. Or, uh, which I can hear people shouting at the screens now thinking, it's just Starmer's way of weaseling his way back into the EU. No. So I think it's really important that the Labour Party is clear about what we will do on the issue of Brexit and our relationship with the European Union, because voters will want to know. So we're laying that out today. And in answer specifically to your question, the Labour Party will not be seeking to rejoin the EU. There will not be a referendum on rejoining. We will not be rejoining the single market or the customs union. But the other thing we won't be doing is deliberately picking fights in order to resolve issues within our own party or sow division. We will be putting public interest before self-interest, unlike the way that Boris Johnson's going about it. It would be a very, very different approach, but it is important, Eamon, you're right to, to challenge me on this, and it's really important that we answer it 
straightforwardly. This is not about rejoining the European Union. Mm -hmm. That being said, that, that's the views of Sir Keir Starmer. Who knows if he'll still be in power when it comes to another election? Lots of rumours swirling over the weekend that uh, Durham police have actually now issued him with the fine. The police saying they won't give a running commentary. Can you update us, please? Because he has committed to resigning if he's fined. Yes. He would resign if he was fined and he hasn't had a fine. I saw some of those rumours at the weekend. I mean, it was extraordinary to... I mean, some of it was, you know, he's been fined and... I mean, he's keeping it a secret. I mean, it's just nonsense. Um, he hasn't had a fine and, um, I, I, you know, we've got to let Durham police do their job. Well, Jenny Chapman there, of course, the uh, Shadow Cabinet Office Minister. Um, well, let's return now to James Heal to digest some of what was being said there. Why is the Labour Party making this announcement today? Well, they're doing so because, partly for several reasons, one of which is there's been pressure within the party uh, from certain elements which want a more integrationist approach with the EU. So we saw Sadiq Khan coming out and suggesting for the return of uh, Britain and the single market. Mm. Um, but the second of all is that Kirsten really needs to put this to bed before the next election. One in three Labour voters voted for Brexit in 2016 and he needs to start trying to make his pitch on what it's going to be because fundamentally uh, he's tried for two years not talking about Brexit. That's had some success in calling an effective truce on the issue. Mm. But if he really wants to be seen as a party of government, he needs to have some kind of solutions to this. And this is an attempt today to roll the pitch and explain what they would do in power. It's, it's interesting, though. We don't, we're not expecting to see a lot of detail other than we'll, we'll do a grown-up negotiation, whatever that's supposed to mean. I wonder, to what extent will this actually do the job that clearly Sir Keir Starmer wants it to do, which is to put this issue to bed? Well, I think it's very... I mean, there's five demands he's going to lay out today, um, five-point plan, and it's very motherhood and apple pie. I mean, it's things which are very sort of tweaks of veterinary um, rules will be changed and things like less queues um, uh, coming into the UK and going out on the UK um, and musicians touring around Europe. I mean, mm. all stuff which is fairly uncontroversial. Mm. Um, I think the question is, is what is his approach on Brexit? And I think it seems to be that, you know, we won't pick fights with the EU. We want goodwill. Mm. But I think that... To be honest, all the goodwill in the world won't solve some of these issues. The EU is a hard-nosed political player. Mm. And uh, you see that despite all the UK's good work on Ukraine and, and willingness to work on security, which is something Keir Starmer wants to press, there doesn't seem to be much in the way of goodwill there. Um, so I don't think it'll achieve much, I'm afraid. Yes, I suppose sometimes playing nicely with the EU is not the way to get stuff out of it. And it's, it's hard deadlines that do make decisions. But um, just finally... This question of Beergate, what, why on earth did these rumours swirl around on the internet? I think there was one uh, left-wing website that sort of put forward something saying Starmer, they texted Starmer's personal phone, I think. He didn't reply and therefore they said, oh, he's probably been fined. I mean, it seems a bit, uh, bit nonsensical. I think there's a bit of wishful thinking here. Um, there was an update in the Mail on Sunday which said that some uh, witnesses have been, have been interviewed by the police to confirm they'd be able to go and testify in court, but there's not been nothing like a sort of injunction or anything like that mm -hmm. as far as I can see. And um, don't worry, I'm sure GB News will be first to report if there is any news on Beergate. Well, we will keep our... Um, uh, what's, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Ears to the ground. We'll keep our ears to the ground on that issue for now. James Hill, thank you very much for joining us here on the briefing this morning, covering those all of those issues there. Now, the, the price at the petrol pump seems to be endlessly rising, with the average price to fill up a family car now at an astounding £100 a tank. So it's no surprise people are starting to take matters into their own hands. Over in Colchester, a protest will start today. Our East of England reporter Ed Crawford has more. Ed, What's the latest where you are? Hi, thanks for joining me. So, at the moment, I am stood on an overpass above the A12 between Colchester and Chelmsford. Now, earlier this morning, there was severe travel delay along this road when a group of protesters staged a go-slow protest. What a go-slow protest is, is you go along a road or a motorway at a reduced speed, and the idea is to back up the traffic and cause as much disruption as possible. Now, the protesters are unhappy about the fuel prices at the pump and they hope that their action today would force the government to take action and reduce the petrol prices. We don't know whether that's happened at the moment, but as you can see, traffic has returned to normal. The police have moved the protesters on. Everything has gone back to normal. But will these protests have far-reaching implications? Only time will tell. Back to you.
Well, Ed, thank you so much for bringing us that update. Of course, this seems to be a big, big issue that will be brought forward in our politics more and more, particularly potentially as we get towards the winter. Well, let's move on to our final story of the day. The G7 and NATO summits were obviously dominated by the ongoing war in Ukraine, the highest inflation rates in decades and a rapidly worsening global food crisis. Western countries can do nothing much to stop Putin's war in Ukraine without getting directly involved, except, of course, continue to impose those sanctions on Russia. However, the negative effects of these non-military tools will only increase over time, particularly as winter comes. People, of course, need oil to heat their homes. Lots of it coming from Russia. Uh, so what on earth is going on with how the UK is engaging? with these issues. Let's speak now to Bob Seeley, the Conservative MP for the Isle of Wight, former sergeant in the British Army uh, and, uh, and a member of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Thanks for joining me, Bob. Uh, firstly, it was a very significant NATO summit last week, probably the most significant NATO summit that we've seen uh, in a decade or more. Was it a success? Um, I think broadly it was a success in the sense that uh, there was a reasonably large amount of unity, although one should not judge the success of Western policy making by the fact that people are united, because actually you have to be united in order to act. So it's great that they're united. It is reasonably good that they are acting, but they have to continue to act on scale in the medium and the long term, and those are bigger issues. It's interesting looking at how the UK domestically has responded to these issues. Of course, the Prime Minister making the announcement that defence spending will rise to 2.5% of GDP by the end of the decade. Uh, is this yeah, about... I mean, uh, just on that, Tom, just on that point, I mean, that's basically a non-promise and one shouldn't be too congratulatory about that. Uh, effectively, if you're saying we have a, a fantastic, well, we have a profound defence emergency at the moment, so we're going to increase spending, but you're not going to notice it for eight years, you're effectively kicking spending, that increased spending into the long grass, or frankly, into the into the medium term, almost long term by Western democratic standards. So actually, it's not much of a promise. And I think it's frankly pretty disappointing. Is it disappointing that the United Kingdom, by some measures, is the third largest spender on defence in the world, the third or fourth largest spender in the world, with the largest spender in Europe? Uh, uh, why, why then is our army so comparatively small? Are we just uh, spending the money in the wrong places? Or I, I, it, it does seem extraordinary that we do spend so much okay. money yeah. on the on this yeah. issue. Yeah. I think you're looking at, at issues within defence, and there are defence experts much more capable of talking about this than me. But you're dealing mm. with pensions, uh, pension rights. Uh, you're dealing with procurement. Uh, you're, you're 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 looking at a ministry that has that delivers very few major procurement projects on time and on budget. Mm -hmm. So you are looking at a whole host of issues when it comes to the efficiency of spending in the defence field. And the fact is that it costs, you know, a fifth or a tenth to employ a Russian conscript than it would be to employ a much better trained British soldier. You're also looking at T-72s, which are much cheaper um, than a lot of the kit that we are that, that we produce and therefore you get economies of scale so if you look at relative spending we don't do so well you're looking at an absolute spending and overall figure which is very large Tom how effective we are at that spend uh, that that expenditure is a different matter so more people will get more bang for their buck because in many other countries soldiers and air force men and sailors cost less but also because the kit is built not quite to Western spec because you're going to lose a lot more of it in a war. Now, that's, that's a matter for debate. Um, but, you know, the Russians have been losing a great deal of kit in this war. That's certainly true. Yes, and I suppose they've been uh, looking after their kit uh, in, a, in a not particularly uh, good no, way over the dreadful. last few years. And it's, it's been breaking down all over the place. I suppose that does... Uh, uh, put some backing towards the British way of doing things. But let's look at NATO as a whole now, because, of course, it's getting two new members after Turkish opposition seemingly melted away. We, we, we don't have any details, uh, public details, that is, of, of whatever deal may have been done uh, between Turkey and, uh, and, and f uh, Finland and Sweden. Uh, what do we expect has gone on behind the scenes here? I suspect some kind of reassurance has been given by the Swedes and the Finns 
over um, what the Turks consider to be extremist Kurdish groups that operate in some European countries like Sweden and like Finland. Um, and clearly the Turks wanted to highlight that, highlight the issues that they have, highlight the fact that they don't think that many of the political arms of these, these Kurdish groups that operate in Turkey are, are, are justifiable. Uh, they are more likely to want to see them as terrorist groups because they are related to you know, paramilitary groups within Turkey. And there is a, a, a there was, for example, in the, in the Syrian war and the war against ISIS, a great deal of friction between the UK, the US, France and Turkey over how they viewed the Syrians in the in this sort of um, uh, the Syrians who uh, sorry the Kurds in northern Syria who provided a great deal of, of the foot soldiers that the West used to defeat ISIS um, and who we whom we supported with intelligence with air power with special force um, support etc. So there were frictions and I think what the the Turks perhaps you know very understandably want is an understanding of the importance of you know, Turkish internal and external security to the NATO alliance. And because of Turkey's role, actually I have some sympathy with the Turks here and what they're trying to do. And I think it's good that, they, that, that their opposition has, they've given up on their opposition. So clearly they have made the point they've wanted to make and NATO has listened. So that was a good outcome. And, and clearly some greater unity there. I'm afraid we've only got 30 seconds left in this conversation. But just lastly, there are four countries that are in the European Union that are not in NATO. They include uh, uh, Ireland and Austria <laughs> and Malta <laughs> and Cyprus. Um, what, what's the chance, in your view, of these countries joining NATO too? Um, you have to ask them specifically. I'm not sure. In uh, I, think it w I think everyone should pay for their own security. So if you look at a country like Ireland, Ireland is effectively entirely dependent on its security from the UK, whilst at the same time being very often politically critical of the UK. I think that's an uncomfortable relationship, and either the Irish should take into account that we effectively provide their last line of defence, uh, or pay for it themselves. Mm. Start choice. That's a strong, it's a strong point there. Bob Seeley, thank you so much for joining me this morning on The Briefing. Really appreciate your time. I'm afraid that's it for the programme. Coming up, it's To The Point with Mercy Maroki and Bev Turner. But first, here's the weather. Looking ahead to today's weather and the UK's looking blustery with frequent showers in the north, but drier and brighter across the south. Here's the details. Lunchtime across the southwest of England will be rather cloudy, with a few showers around, especially across Cornwall and West Devon. Temperatures will be around 16 or 17 Celsius. Southeast England and East Anglia, however, will be drier, although here sunshine will be rather limited. Despite the cloud, temperatures will be around 20 Celsius. After a cloudy morning across Wales, come lunchtime it could be brightening up, although there may still be a few showers in the south. Skies will also be brightening up across parts of the Midlands. However, southeastern parts will remain rather cloudy throughout lunchtime. In the sunshine, though, it will be feeling rather warm. Northern England will have a rather blustery lunchtime with some showers, especially towards the west, and it'll feel rather cool in the breeze, but sheltered and in the sun, it'll feel fairly pleasant. Showers will also affect much of Scotland with the heaviest and most frequent across the northern and western parts of the country. It'll also be rather windy, making it feel pretty cool there. And it'll also be pretty fresh across Northern Ireland, although those showers may start to ease a little as we'll move through lunchtime with some sunny spells developing. So it'll remain showery in the north during the rest of the day, but southern areas will turn drier and brighter. And that's how the weather's shaping up for the rest of the day. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. 
Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to